Good afternoon, universe. <clears throat> it is the 15th of February, and on what is turning into the marathon day of all marathons at 12.45 here, on the day after Valentine's Day, happy 364 more days till that stupid day rolls around day. Um, <clears throat> you know, my neighbor, I can see my neighbor's garage directly from my kitchen window, and it the garage door is occasionally open like it is right now and i don't think they ever mean to leave it open like i think it's always accidental when it's up because the car is gone and i know there's a bike in there if somebody were to walk by they could just grab um so i feel like i should go run over there and hit the garage door button and make sure it goes down but i mean this isn't the first time i've seen their garage door open in fact, in the last, like, I'd say four months, it's been a chronic issue. Whereas before that, it was never an issue. So it makes me think that something's malfunctioning in their garage door. But obviously, they come home and find it open, so they know about it. So now it's gotten too far in time for me to go over there and do anything, because it'd be weird if this was the very first time I ever noticed their garage door open. Sure, then I might look like a helpful neighbor trying to be assistant. But... They've discovered it at least 15 times that I know of, if not 30 more times that I don't. So they know it's a problem. So if I go running over there now, they'll think I'm trying to steal their bike, whatever. So here's a way that while I could make the universe better, I don't. And I don't really know my neighbors. This is obviously a good way to go get to know them because, hey, you know, your garage door is open. I could just go knock on the front door. But with the car gone, I know that means that at least one of the parents, if not both of them, are gone. And uh, so if I go knocking on the door, I certainly don't want to talk to any of the kids. But here I sit, right? Stupidly not helping the universe in a capacity that I could clearly go help it. Um, I don't know why actions like those aren't just reflexive. Why aren't we just here helping people that clearly have a situation where we can lend assistance. Um, <clears throat> I guess that's kind of the theme for today, or this particular recording, because the next recording, I'm going to tell you my worst story, the one that I'm most ashamed of. And I sort of have a gold medal, silver medal, bronze medal uh, platform of my worst stories. And I'm going to start with my gold medal story because, honestly, in, episode, in the next episode after that, I'm going to demand some accountability from people who have kept their worst story private as well. And uh, I figure if I'm going to ask that of the universe, then I might as well be the karmic provider of the space in which that can be enabled by admitting to you what I consider to be the worst moment of my life in terms of the action I took. Um, but today, or in this recording, to help <laughs> offset the nervousness, and I do not want to tell you that story. I, I don't. But I know that the people who are hiding secrets that they're ashamed of don't want to tell you their stories either. And so I'm going to ask for your kindness, forgiveness, and understanding when I do share that moment, because I know I was weak. I know I could have done better, and I do regret it, and I live with the sorrow of that moment to this day. And I'll never release that sorrow entirely, but I've never told anyone in the universe this story, except for my sister. Um, and so I guess in some ways, it's time to come clean. But because I have had moments of weakness that I regret, that doesn't mean I have to define myself from my moments of weakness. I don't. And as a matter of fact, I absolutely do not define myself by that moment. Nor do I define myself by my moments of sheer uh, uh, giving or uh, benevolence toward my fellow man and fellow woman and fellow humankind and fellow homo sapien 
because there's one thing I've always been I root for the underdog I want to see the ones who are up against the biggest challenge pull it off because to me it's just a reminder to everybody else that no matter how stacked you feel the odds are against you never give up on yourself just don't and um, so when I see the underdog being taken advantage of well that really irks me and <clears throat> when I was uh, 20 years old was I 19 I don't know it was the soft it was a summer after my sophomore junior and senior years um, I worked in an, a summer enrichment camp in Wellesley Massachusetts called exploration and uh, this was a camp that catered to the world's elite wealthy kids and the concept of the camp was actually rather ingenious and these two um, the owners Ann and Arnie and they were great people this was a terrific time of my life um, these two people had thought what if we offered a space that um, was a creative uh, sort of uh, pseudo academic setting where the elite of the Ivy League and the East Coast um, top college uh, institutions were the instructors at this camp. And I just happened to be lucky enough to become one of the 60 people who got to work there. And <laughs> the reason, actually, now that I think about it, I guess those days shoveling shit were, were absolutely critical because, oh, sorry. Oh, I think that might be my first recorded gun. Oh, but that stretch felt good, though. Um, the reason I got interviewed <laughs> um, by Ann and Arnie's daughter they she re came and remote interviewed me for a position in the office to work administratively and so not as one of the instructors but to basically take care of uh, to take care of transportation needs for the students whether they be going to see a whale watching tour or they were one of the local day students who was coming into the program just for the day. And this is critical that I was in this role. And uh, <clears throat> so I get interviewed and the reason that they had selected my application to be interviewed is this position they considered the hardest position in the entire lineup of, of jobs because you had to juggle so much chaotic information and do so many different things and it was kind of a stressful job i'll be honest especially in a camp full of other stupid jobs <laughs> but um, uh on my application because the summer before i had worked at the wilderness school and shoveled all that shit, i put on my application that i was willing to do the worst of the worst because this is what i had spent my last summer doing and that's what they flagged as worthy of being interviewed and then I got the job and and I loved it they loved me it was a great place to work I mean this is these were being surrounded by this staff was the most dynamic time of my life these were the greatest of the greats I when it came to creativity especially and so I mean these were the six weeks of my of my uh, 1989 90 and 91 years that these six weeks were the best even better than college and college was freaking awesome so um but why why it's critical that i started as the transportation director is because it meant that i was very familiar with what were qualified as the day students well what were the day students the day students were kids from the local area who had applied as quote-unquote financial aid situations because really they couldn't afford the three grand it was for three weeks or 5500 it was for six weeks in 1989 i'm sure that's the equivalent of twenty thousand dollars today 
but whatever it was ludicrously expensive and we got paid ludicrously well <laughs> for doing this job for six weeks at the time my my pay for six weeks worth of work was three thousand dollars so 500 a week for and i had all my expenses taken care of it was literally pocket money um <clears throat> and and was a great thing for me because it meant that i had money to not work full time my junior and senior years when I was so far behind academically, I really needed to pick up some slack. And um, and that was a good thing that I could take that time because I had been a lousy student my first two years. And, <clears throat> and really in many capacities needed to learn to be a good student. And without the, 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 um, the padding financially that this job gave me, because I also was able to work a work study job the other part of the summer. So I ended up making like $6,000 each summer. And that was a lot of money for me back then. So I don't even know why I'm talking about that, but exploration was one of those great windfalls. And that whole windfall is because I stood in that barn and shoveled shit with DUG for two straight days. So sometimes, even when you're doing what looks like the worst possible thing you could possibly be doing with your time, it will pay off in the long run. And <clears throat> getting to know the day students was awesome because they were my kind of people they were from the area so everything from Roxbury to uh, new uh, Newtown to uh, um, what was what the North End and uh, God I can't think of all Boston's Natick suburbs at the moment but I got to know not only the kids coming in that way but they got bussed in we had school buses to bring in these kids and there were like I want to say 60 to 80 of them in a, in a program that had 1,500, 1,800 kids, something like that. So they were a small minority of the kids. And all the other kids were residential, staying in the Wellesley campus dorms overnight for three weeks, many of them staying the whole six-week term. Um, but most of them staying uh, in the dorms had paid three thousand dollars or whatever for the three-week term so these kids had money they had come in with the kind of material goods that rich kids have and were essentially you know loaded some of these kids were the the, the sons and daughters of some rather famous people and so <clears throat> the uh the day students obviously had an inferiority complex because they were none of this. And in fact, not only were they none of this, but they were the students who went home every night, who did not participate in the evening activities, who did not get to do things like drive-in movie night, did not get to do things like um, go to the planetarium because that was an evening excursion. So they couldn't even qualify. And I, you know, I'm more of a day student than I am the rich student. In fact, I'm neither. I'm, I fall securely into what you would consider middle-class America life in the 80s. But I always felt like if you're going to put a program like this together, then don't make 80 of the students coming to the program feel like the losers. That's bullshit. And, uh, you know, why give these kids an opportunity to come to a program to feel inferior? And that's basically what they were doing. If in no other way, just in the schedule that these kids couldn't participate in. Yeah, they could stay over one night on the weekend with a host kid. They were allowed to stay Friday or Saturday night so that they could go to one of the weekend activities if they paid for it, which was another bullshit thing. But, uh, so there was that. Um, so the, the whole first year, I just dealt with it, right? You just do your job. But the second year, I came in, and I already knew some of these kids. They, were, they had come back. I knew them. And, uh, and I was friends with them. And, and I was sick of it. I wasn't going to put up with the bullshit anymore. So, I started a program where they could be hosted on any night. Because all these kids had room to have... Sorry.
the rich kids had room to learn just as much from what uh, hang on all right listen the day students are the real people you know they're the ones who have experienced hardship have had to fight for opportunities that are just handed to everybody else and so it was it was critical to me that these kids not miss out on the opportunity to have their little rich bubbles burst it a little bit because you know there are people in the world working their asses off just to have the slight opportunity to experience what you take for granted every day and if you're not going to learn that when that opportunity is there to be learned then you may go through life and never learn it and you may turn into the people who think you're better than others or whatever so to me, the program was missing out as much on what um, what there was to be had in what the day students could offer, as much as what the day students could learn given these extraordinary opportunities. I don't know why I'm crying. I just... I always feel for the the ones who work the hardest and barely even get the opportunities everybody else is just handed. Anyway, hang on. I'm going to hit pause for a second. Unpause. Okay. I only paused for a minute. I just needed to gather myself a little bit. I didn't want to sob through the next explanation. And, uh... So I started this program where you could host a day student if you were a residential student on any given night. And that allowed the day students to participate in a lot more of the activities because they could sleep over literally five nights a week. And it changed the whole complexion of what they thought of themselves. And, uh, and you could see it, you know, even the bus drivers, they knew because their buses were empty. Uh, and it's funny, like, uh, you know, how do you miss that? How do you miss that these kids are being overlooked to the point that when you give them an advantage to take full advantage of the program, every one of them jumps in, you know, how'd you miss that? <laughs> how did those kids have to fight so hard for something that should have been seen? You know, well, anyway, on my third year, the last event that happens at this thing is a dance and, uh, and the kids all start, you know, you can imagine they're a bunch of high school kids. They start hooking up the day they get there, but by the time three weeks have rolled around, some of them are so in love that they can barely part ways. So the end of the whole event is a dance. It's like a prom. It's funny. They all get dressed up. It's entertaining as hell. But because of logistics and timing and how late it goes, the day kids were never allowed to participate. And this was the year that I, I basically <laughs> went rogue. And uh, we had a van at the program. Ah, by the third year, I knew, you know, I had enough trust that I keys to the van. And uh, on my own, I just decided to bring 15 day students to the dance. <laughs> and yeah, that was, you know, the end of my, my time at exploration. But I don't regret it. Because... When I dropped those kids off after the dance, 
Like, I got the kind of hugs from these kids. I just knew how much it meant. I didn't care that I was going to lose my job over it. It just was like, it was the right thing to do. And, uh... And there was a conversation about me not losing my job, but ultimately I did. Because I think everybody knew I was trying to do something good, but the liability that I'd put the program in by picking those kids up and taking them home, especially at light, especially into Roxbury and some questionable areas, well, fuck it. You know what? I loved my time at Exploration. I even loved getting fired. Because for once I got fired for the right reasons. <laughs> <laughs>